My second lecture today is on the Great Depression, and I want to spend a little bit of time putting that uh, issue uh, in perspective uh, with the earlier uh, discussions and the earlier show I did uh, two days ago. Uh, I don't have much in the way of slides this time, but that's okay. i got stories to tell. Uh, and I want to start from uh, a book by uh, Randall Parker, Reflections on the Great Depression. It's sort of an interesting book, 2002. Uh, and uh, Parker uh, recognized that uh, a lot of economists who lived through the Great Depression are getting pretty old. And so he rushed around to interview all the ones he could find, Milton Friedman and uh, others, uh, uh, on the issue of the, of the Great Depression. And many of them were inspired into economics by living through the Great Depression and wondering what in the world caused that. Okay, And uh, there were a number of questions uh, asked. And I think uh, Parker had the what I think is sort of a perverse perspective or the wrong perspective on it. But uh, that's why I use uh, some of his questions to start off my uh, talk. Uh, one of his stock questions, then this time he's asking um, Morris Adelman, uh, what was the initial impetus for the Great Depression? In other words, what caused the downturn? Why, why didn't the boom keep going? Why did it turn south? Uh, and then what accounts for its depth? And he might well have said length and depth. Uh, if you think about the Great Depression and what made it so great was the length and depth. Okay, 25% unemployment at its worst, nah, 10 years uh, in length. That's enough to get your attention. Okay, capital G, capital D, uh, Great Depression. Now, uh, the, the talk I gave uh, on Monday uh, was aimed at showing how uh, credit-induced boom is unsustainable. That if an uh, artificially low interest rate uh, t triggers too many long-term investments, there won't be enough resources to finish them all, and of necessity the economy will turn down. Uh, and essentially that is uh, the theory of the business cycle according to all, uh, the Austrians. It's a, it's, it's a theory of the unsustainability of a credit-induced boom. It'll turn down. Uh, there is a sense in which it's true, in fact you hear this statement made even by the Austrians, uh, that the bigger the boom, the bigger the bust. Well, okay, uh, it, that's true in the sense that uh, if there's a lot of misallocation for a substantial period of time, well, it'll take longer for the market to compensate for it all, to, to undo it all and get back on track. So the bigger the boom, uh, the bigger the bust. But uh, historically, it turns out that uh, many downturns are much, much deeper and much, much longer than they would need to be just to correct the uh, misallocations during the boom. Uh, and so uh, we want to distinguish between theories about why we have to have a bust and theories that explain just how deep the depression is and just how long <coughs> it is. We certainly don't want to take the depth and length of the Great Depression to be a measure of how far out of kilter uh, the allocation of resources was in 1929, okay? Because there are lots of other factors at play that uh, caused uh, the Depression to be deep and long. But here's a typical answer by Morris Adelman in this case, but uh, and, and, and it's one that a number of people repeated, but maybe not quite as explicitly as Adelman. Uh, and it goes like this. He says, well, I don't know uh, what the initial impetus was. Uh, and I can't account for how deep it went. Well, this is not exactly real knowledge that we're getting from him. But, he says, except to say that the second question is much more important than the first. Now, <laughs> I challenge that. I say, no, 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 that's not the important question. The important question is, why did... Times get bad to start with, not why were those times so awfully bad. Uh, so uh, let me put it this a different way. Uh, what caused good times in the 1920s to turn bad? And of course, uh, the subsidiary question is, why were the bad times in the 1930s so awfully bad? Right? Uh, and here, to put it in perspective, 
It's that first question that Hayek answered, that Mises and then Hayek provided the, the theory to answer. Uh, central bank driven boom of the 20s was inherently unsustainable because investment decisions were at odds with consumer preferences. The artificially low interest rate misallocated resources intertemporally, too many long term, not enough short term, necessitating economy wide market cor uh, corrections. This is the Austrian theory. And it even used the term as pretty mild term market corrections. In other words, had the market been left alone to do its job, uh, at the point of the downturn, uh, the depression might have lasted uh, a year and a half and it might have been not nearly so deep. Okay. In fact, uh, I, I make that statement on the basis of the downturn in 20 and 21 uh, when we didn't have uh, the government intervening in the way that Hoover and then Roosevelt did. And that was a fairly sharp depression, but very short lived because the uh, market recovered fairly quickly. Uh, now, this other question, which is an interesting question from uh, a historical point of view, uh, because we know how bad the 30s were, how long that depression lasted, all the suffering and so that went on. Uh, uh, but it, it, it has lots of answers. In fact, uh, what I've said here is a hodgepodge of perverse policies of the Hoover and Roosevelt administrations that stood in the way of a market correction and greatly magnified the dimensions, both length and depth of the depression. So this is what I want to focus on uh, today. I want to get it straight that, uh, uh, that while the Austrian theory I think holds good and is a very good explanation of, of why we had the downturn, if you want to understand length and depth, then you've got to take into account a, a lot of oddball, silly things that happened, uh, policies coming out of Washington uh, during that period. And uh, happily, if that's the right word, I don't know, uh, it will let me link uh, this lecture topic to the discussion of the current situation, <laughs> not too happily, I guess, uh, where perverse policies currently being uh, employed by the Obama administration <coughs> are much likely, just as likely to make uh, uh, this experience um, challenge the one that we had in, during the Great uh, Depression. We'll see uh, how that works out. Um, okay, now just to put things in perspective, uh, this is a graph I pulled off the web uh, that uh, that shows you can see here. I think you can probably read that G, GNP is an older graph uh, per capita relative to a long string of years, 1889 to 1929, uh, and it shows a deviation from the trend established over that long period. Well, you can see that when we get to 1929, the thing just goes off the chart. In fact, there is a little more chart here. We can see how far off the chart it goes. You get the idea. Okay. There it is. There it is. Okay. So, again, you can see that it really was uh, a dramatic downturn, uh, but uh, initiated, initiated by misallocation, in fact, you can see here that during the 20s, and this is very true to other historical uh, applications, that all during the 20s, the uh, economy was above trend, but uh, not uniformly so. There were, there were actually a couple of three distinct uh, surges here, and especially this one in uh, between about 27 and 29. It was at a point where the boom had started to falter, and the Fed was stepping in to try to do something about it, to try to keep the boom going, okay, uh, uh, which eventually precipitated the bust. So there's no claim of the Austrian theory that, that this boom, either this third of it or the, the, the whole period of the 20s, this boom in and of itself is responsible for uh, that degeneration clear into that low point, or that this boom is responsible for uh, the length of time uh, that it took. After all, there's 10 years, okay, back up, there's 10 years there, and according to some of the Austrian uh, historians, and I have uh, Bob Higgs in mind, he argues that it was longer than that, that, uh, that the only way that you could limit it to 10 years is count all the spending during World War II uh, as, as being 
uh, you know, adding to the welfare, being a part of the boom that followed. Uh, and also, if you look at the, the pattern, uh, what you find in, in that depression and probably in the current one, uh, is, uh, is that the caving into depression uh, takes relatively little time comparing to, to compared to the eventual climbing back out. Okay, uh, If you've caught on to the news, and you probably have, that uh, recessions or depressions are measured peak to trough. All right. So in other words, when, when, when we finally hit the bottom and start upward, then the, then the recession or depression is declared to be over. That's the NBER dating, uh, recession dating uh, criteria. So uh, it, you might think that it's over when the economy's returned to normalcy. But no, no, it's over when we pass the bottom. All right. Uh, and what I've been saying in, in my classes at Auburn and elsewhere is if you think this recession is bad, just wait till you watch the recovery. You know, it's going to be worse because it's going to be longer. All right. So uh, if you're trying to measure it until we're back to uh, the prosperity or back to a normal economy, it's much longer than just uh, the recession uh, years. Um, OK, uh, if we look at the unemployment and again, this is uh, taken from the Web. Uh, you can see that the, the, the Great Depression was more intense and uh, possibly longer. We'll, we'll have to wait and see than the current downturn. Because this shows that uh, in 19, uh, actually it peaked out in uh, March of 33, uh, with unemployment over 25% compared, say, to 9.5 uh, in the current period. So we're down here about 9.5. Now, having said that, I have to recognize that uh, unemployment was measured differently back then than it is now. And one of the ways it was measured differently is that the government counted as unemployed uh, the people that were actually participants in the Civil Conservation Corps and so on, who in a very literal sense were employed by the government. But if, if they were employed by the government just in a make-work project, then we're listed as unemployed, unemployed by uh, the private sector. They don't do that anymore. If you're employed by the government, you're just employed. That's it. Okay, Unemployed means something above that. It's also different, though, in that here it's showing uh, unemployment down as low as zero. Well, uh, these days, of course, we, we allow for some normal rate of unemployment, natural rate of unemployment. People just between jobs or just entering the labor force, which itself can be as much as five or even six percent. So, uh, just to emphasize that it's measured differently back then, but still, uh, the difference in measurements uh, doesn't fully account for that uh, huge difference in uh, the actual unemployment suffered during that period. <coughs> Lots of unemployment. Okay. Uh, I just want to list the sampling of the literature. Uh, in case you become history buffs on the Great Depression, uh, I consider myself, a, I'm not a historian, I'm a history buff, okay? I like to read books on the Great Depression. It just puts me in the right mood. I, guess. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Uh, but early stuff, you know, like John T. Flynn's The Roosevelt Myth is a, is a great book to read. Um, if you want a hardcore Austrian stuff, read uh, Murray Rothbard, America's Great Depression. Uh, another book that came out earlier still is Lionel Robbins' book on the Great Depression, but that was that was not so much the U.S. as uh, as Britain. Still a good book. Uh, and then I'm going to skip over a lot. I mean, there's there's tons of literature, uh, books and articles on on the Great Depression, but just some recent stuff. Jim Powell. This is one of the more readable books. And uh, a real masterpiece as far as just uh, the, the writing style is FDR's Folly. Uh, and uh, the sub that's the book right there. Subtitle is How Roosevelt and His New Deal Prolonged the Great Depression, which helps make my point. In other words, the length of the Great Depression uh, was much more a function of the policies during the Great Depression than any misalignment of investment that occurred during the 20s. And still a more recent book that just came out this year, I reviewed it for um, the Freeman. Um, Adam Cohen, I think I left out an E, C-O-H-E-N, 
which is called Nothing to Fear. You, you know, from the uh, inaugural speech, we have nothing to fear but fear itself. Nice picture of Roosevelt on the cover. Uh, and his uh, subtitle is FDR's Inner Circle and the Hundred Days that Created Modern, modern America. It's a very interesting book, and you think at this point there's nothing else you could say about the Great Depression, you know, but, but there is. And what uh, Cohen does is um, look not so much at Roosevelt himself as the people he surrounded himself with, like um, Raymond Moley and um, Francis Perkins and the budget director, Louis Douglas. Uh, and it's here when we see these people and what they were doing, what they were directions they were pushing Roosevelt and they were pushing in different directions they were, it wasn't a monolith at all uh, but it gave rise to this hodgepodge that's why it's such a hodgepodge uh, Francis Perkins is quoted as saying that uh, uh, well she said that Roosevelt was illiterate when it came to economics and that's quite a statement coming from Francis Perkins you know, who didn't know a whole lot herself she she had studied under an uh, institutionalist in uh, influence in Germany, the historical school, and, uh, and yet had picked up the idea that more spending is the key to uh, prosperity. So that's what she was trying to feed to Roosevelt. But uh, all of the uh, people working for Roosevelt realized that, A, Roosevelt didn't know too much, and what he knew was whatever he had heard most recently. Okay, So you have to get Roosevelt's ear and tell him uh, things uh, uh, fairly regularly to get him to go the way you want him to go. Uh, so anyhow, that's just suggestions for things that you might have. There's a reading, but there's a lot of stuff on it. Um, what I want to do now, which is mostly storytelling, uh, is show you some of the things that were going on during the Hoover and Roosevelt era. And I could have said Hoover-Roosevelt era. And uh, here, I, I, I like Murray Rothbard's uh, treatment of the issues, because he doesn't make a big distinction between Hoover's policies and Roosevelt's policies. It just wasn't true that Hoover was Mr. Laissez-Faire and that uh, and that Roosevelt reversed that. Uh, if uh, if there was a difference, it was a difference in verve and magnitude and so on with which uh, Roosevelt pursued the interventionist policies. But uh, Hoover certainly pursued some of his own and with uh, and with bad effects. Um, start out with a Hoover policy, which is called, which was called at the time, and is referred to now by historians as a high wage policy. Um, it, it's really a, a, an odd idea. Well, it's an idea that suggests no understanding of, of economics. If you remember the period, the the, uh, the economy had turned down, uh, the money supply uh, had collapsed. There was a deflation going on. Prices were falling. Uh, and there was uh, unemployment emerging. Uh, and, and then the goal was to keep wages up. Well, this is a disastrous uh, policy uh, if you're trying to prevent uh, unemployment. The wages needed to fall. Uh, fall in a, in a way that corresponded with the falling prices. And to keep wages up was just to increase the uh, unemployment. And yet, uh, that was the Hoover policy. Uh, the particular strategy he used was in terms of firms that had government contracts. They were threatened that they would lose their government contracts if they cut wages. And so those kinds of firms were caught in a bind, that uh, the market wage was lower than what they were paying. Uh, and yet, if, if they paid the market wage, they'd lose a government contract and wouldn't have any work to do anyhow. So uh, instead of you had instead of having more people working at a lower nominal wage and possibly no lower real wage, uh, they had fewer people working at a wage that allowed them to keep their government uh, contracts. Um, there's a book out. You probably you tell me the the authors that slipped my mind right now. Uh, out of work. Um, it's a friend of mine. Why can't I remember his name? But anyhow, out of, pardon? Yeah, Vetter. Vetter and Galloway. I was trying to think of. Vetter and Galloway wrote Out of Work. And they covered this uh, high wage policy of, of Hoover and covered it very well. Um, 
This is something that uh, now it's hard to imagine that you could pull this off, the crop destruction program. That's what it was called uh, during the early Roosevelt uh, New Deal. Uh, and, and the idea was that people were having trouble selling their crops. And this applied across the board. Well, people were having trouble selling lots of things, having trouble selling potatoes or pork or cotton or dairy. Uh, one of the reasons they were having problems because government was doing everything it could to keep prices from falling. This, this was the idea that was uh, operative at the time, that uh, Roosevelt's advisors were largely lawyers. Lawyers, not economists. They were lawyers. Now, I can't say it would have been much better had they been economists, but they were lawyers. And again, I guess I mentioned this morning about how lawyers think. Uh, and here I go again uh, about lawyers. Uh, but uh, lawyers then were like lawyers now in that they think they know everything about everything because, after all, they studied law. All right? uh, and their reasoning was that uh, we need to keep prices up so we can keep wages up, so we can keep spending up, um, which, of course, makes no sense if, uh, if the money supply uh, is collapsing. But uh, that was what they were trying to do, keep the prices up. And one way to keep them up is by destroying crops. All right? uh, the uh, potato... Uh, destruction is a, is a good story. It used to be in the old history books. Uh, potatoes are grown in Idaho. You knew that. Other places too, but Idaho is a biggie. Uh, farmers in Idaho were having trouble selling their potatoes. Well, of course they were. Everybody was having trouble selling anything. But with the government program, the farmers could bring their potatoes to a central location, make literally mountains of potatoes, uh, be paid for the potatoes by the government, and the potatoes would be burned on the spot. Now, potatoes don't burn all that well. It's pour gasoline on the potatoes. Some of the older history books have aerial photos of potatoes burning. <laughs> okay, so a huge, uh, you know, big way to destroy potatoes. I can test your metal as a budding economist here, but to ask uh, sort of two questions. One is. Will burning potatoes help prop up the price of potatoes? In other words, will it help prop up the prices of potatoes you don't burn? And I see people have studied their micro. Yeah, that, that's right. It does a trick. Now, but the second question is, will that bring back prosperity? <laughs> <laughs> so you say you're a good microeconomist and a good macroeconomist. <laughs> yeah, that'll, that will prop up the price of potatoes, but won't bring back prosperity. Let me go to cotton. I'll come back to pork in a minute. Uh, cotton is one of my favorite stories because it's here in the South. You know, potatoes in Idaho, cotton in Alabama. You know, that's the way it goes. Uh, and in Alabama uh, at the time, they had to have a crop destruction program. Uh, and here it was plowing under every other row or every third row, depending on just when it was implemented here, of cotton. Uh, again, I could ask the same questions about cotton that I ask about potatoes, but I'll make a different point is that in the South, cotton farming at that time was done with the aid of mules. And it turns out if you had a good mule, he wouldn't walk on cotton. He'd walk between the rows, okay, very carefully, because he knows what happens if he walks on cotton. Bad things, okay. But, if the farmer is trying to plow under a row of cotton, he has to have the mule walk right down the row of cotton. And guess what? The mules wouldn't do it. Which led to an editorial in the Mobile uh, paper saying that the mules had a better understanding of economic <laughs> than the man in the White House. Okay. Uh, and uh, some farmers, though, got their mules to do it by whipping the mule. Whip them, whip them until they would sub submit and walk down the row of cotton. And then once, once you've got that done, then you, of course, try to go back to the other mode. And to say the least, the mules were very confused. And uh, farmers uh, complained that they were running their mules because the mules didn't know between the rows, on the rows, you know, make up your minds. So, so that was the cotton program. And again, it reduced uh, cotton output. It propped up the price of cotton. But, of course, it didn't bring back prosperity. In fact, it made it worse, didn't it? It made it worse. Um, same thing for dairy, and you can see, you know, people were in soup lines. They, they, they were hungry. They couldn't get food. Uh, and uh, yet uh, the program 
for the to help the dairy industry was pour the milk out on the ground. Milk your cows, pour the milk out on the ground, and the government would pay for it. They, they paid for the cotton, they paid for the potatoes, paid for the dairy. Uh, and uh, again, uh, it made the depression worse, made it deeper, made it longer. Uh, this is the way of uh, all of those uh, programs. Uh, my son, several years ago, when he was in, I think, the fifth grade, had a history book that had the one page on the Great Depression and had one picture. It was Eleanor Roosevelt uh, standing at the head of a soup line deep, dipping soup for people that were out of work and hungry. But the story on the page was about the dairy program. Uh, and it explained what they were doing, pouring the milk out, the government was paying for it, and so on. And uh, the, the, the textbook writer, always a committee for fifth grade books, said some people thought this was wasteful. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. And, but Roosevelt thought it was best for the economy. Well, that was the end of the section. Well, I haven't found any accounts of them. Uh, it's uh, the, the people, and, you know, they were responding to the incentives they faced. In other words, they couldn't sell their stuff. And if the government's there to buy it, well, okay, you know. So uh, I hope there were some people like that. But... Uh, Somebody find some in the history books. Let let me know. Let me go back to pork. Uh, you know what the pork uh, problem was. So, sometimes I tell that story right after the uh, potato story, and people are afraid that the government was burning pigs or something. <laughs> right. They didn't burn pigs, but they kill pigs. Uh, and uh, when the program got going, and we have some startup effects, but when the program got going, they killed piglets, killed them at birth. Every other pig at birth was put to death. I don't know whether it was the first pig or the second pig, but once they got started, you know, they killed every other pig. When the program first started, they couldn't wait for more pigs to be born, and they slaughtered uh, adult pigs in the fields and just let them lay there. They didn't, they didn't butcher them or anything. They just slaughtered them and just killed them and uh, let them waste away in the field. So they killed pigs, and uh, it, it, it was a big program. You know, if they just killed a few... You might think, well, it's just one of the tidbits of history. But uh, I found in several different sources uh, the figure six million. If six million pigs, either grown hogs or piglets, were put to death uh, during Roosevelt's program, all, all in the hopes of bringing back prosperity by holding up pork prices. Okay, uh, And this went on, uh, and I've just listed three or four here that there's... there's uh, other things that got destroyed. And of course, in today's world, in today's world, we wouldn't think about killing pigs. We just wouldn't do that. We crush cars. Okay? That, uh, this, this aspect of the Obama program, uh, the car crushing aspect of the cash for clunkers, you heard about that. Uh, it's a way of, of destroying old cars so that people are more likely to buy newer ones. Okay? Uh, now, I have to put it in perspective. Uh, if you've read the details of the program, there's a billion dollars set aside by the government currently uh, for the Cash for Clunkers program. All right, Clunkers is the wrong word because a lot of the cars that get traded in are not, are not clunkers. And I'll, I'll, I'll use my own experience. I haven't traded mine in yet, but you know. I'm a, uh, I, have, I have a pickup. That's an 84 model. It's a great pickup. It's in good shape. It's not exactly a collectible. Okay. Uh, and it doesn't have a trade-in value of $4,500. But it gets low mileage. And it qualifies just barely. It's 25 years old. It looks good, that pickup. Especially if you're sort of across the street. You know, if you get real close. I mean, but it looks good. And it runs great. I love to drive it. You know. Still looking for things to haul in it. But that car, I could trade it in in the cash for clunkers program. And I could get $4,500 where I couldn't if I just, just had it as a regular trade in. But if I trade it in, then the government is obliged to crush it. It has to be crushed. It can't be sold to somebody who needs an old work truck or sold to, you know, it's a nice truck. It has to be crushed. And it has to be crushed 
for the same reason that pigs had to be killed, okay, and pot cotton had to be plowed under uh, to make the market better for the automakers who are trying to sell new trucks and new cars. They can't. They can't. They don't want to compete with uh, existing old ones. Uh, if I put it in uh, perspective of magnitudes, I did a little. Uh, Quantitative work. You know, they say Austrians don't do quantitative work. Hey, I do quantitative work. Okay, and I thought uh, let me come, let me find the killed pigs to crushed vehicles ratio. It'll <laughs> 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 let you compare Roosevelt uh, uh, with Obama, and and it turns out that uh, Obama is just not even in the game because he's got uh, he's got a billion dollars. And he's going to, the program's going to last either till November 1st or whenever the billion dollars runs out. And if people on average get 4,000, so you could get either 4,500 or 3,500, depending on particulars. So if the people on average get uh, 4,000, that means they'll crush 250,000 vehicles. Uh, well, 250,000, that's small potatoes compared to 8 or 6 uh, million uh, pig. So it's about a 24 to 1 ratio of, of killed pigs to crushed vehicles. Okay, uh, And yet the, the, a lot of the reasoning of the story, now of course the, the cover for this story is uh, uh, the environment. You have an unholy alliance between the environmentalist on the one hand and the automakers on the other. But when that bill went through Congress, it was the automakers that got the upper hand. Uh, and so it, it serves mainly to um, prop up the price of uh, automobiles. Uh, okay, we've got more stuff here. Uh, the cartelization of uh, industry. And here Roosevelt just uh, ignored the antitrust laws. Now I'm sure uh, De Lorenzo will give a whole talk on antitrust sometime and show you how perverse the antitrust laws are. Uh, but nonetheless, they were laws, and they were on the books, and uh, they were... Uh, just flouted by the Roosevelt administration as he actually arranged, uh, help arrange cartels among the different uh, industrial groups for the purpose of, guess what, propping up prices. Okay? Uh, and so his idea was to have uh, captains of industry from railroad, steel, banking, and a number of others meet at the White House uh, once a, every so, every couple of weeks or whatever. And uh, and he would figure out what he could do for them. Well, in each case, it was they could protect them from competition, and they could agree to uh, limits on what they were produced, and that would hold up prices. So Roosevelt essentially became the cartelizing agent. One things you one of the things you learn about the uh, attempt in a market setting to maintain a cartel is that it's unstable; it will collapse. The cartel will collapse uh, in about as much time as it takes the individuals to get back to their plants and start pumping out more output. But if you have the president of the United States helping to solidify the cartel, hey, it works out a little better for you. Okay, so uh, you have the cartelization of uh, industry in the different industries holding up prices. Uh, there was so much uh, effort to hold up prices that. Uh, it, it casts some doubts on just how serious the collapse of the money supply was. In other words, had prices and wages been allowed to find their market levels, then the collapse of the money supply would have had much less dramatic effects than it had given that the administration was trying to keep prices from adjusting to the new lower money supply. Uh, the Blue Eagle program is one of my favorites. In fact, yes. There well, yeah, yeah, right, the yeah, greatly. I would say greatly exacerbated it. Now, the Austrian economists are um, divided on whether the the reduction of the money supply was a good thing or a bad thing. Uh, I tend to think it was a bad thing, but it wasn't nearly as bad. It wouldn't near has been nearly as bad as it was if it hadn't been for these uh, propping up prices programs, okay? Uh, so I, I think that that is one of the factors. But, of course, Friedman offers it as just a monocausal 
that's it. That's what accounts for the whole shebang. And I don't think that's true because you have to look at some of this other stuff too. In fact, the Blue Eagle program is a good uh, example. Uh, if any of you are staying in the area after the uh, conference is over, just you know, because this is a prime vacation spot, I guess, <laughs> uh, you can go across the state line into Georgia and visit the Little White House. That was Georgia's. Uh, that was uh, Roosevelt's getaway, uh, and, and where they have a Roosevelt Museum, and you can see all about the Blue Eagle program. And the Blue Eagle program worked like this. It was an effort to hold up retail prices in stores. And the way it worked is that uh, participating stores would display the Blue Eagle in their window. We charge Blue Eagle prices. And Blue Eagle prices were high prices. Okay. We charge high prices. We charge Blue Eagle prices. And then Roosevelt in his fireside chats would admonish people, don't shop in any store that doesn't have the Blue Eagle. Okay. Now this is hard even for me to conceive of. I've read enough about it and you know I think it's true. The, uh, but it's hard to conceive of, you know. I don't even think Bill Clinton could have pulled that off. Okay. But here Roosevelt is is admonishing people not to not to buy unless they charge the Blue Eagle prices. And so of course the storekeepers didn't like it because they couldn't sell their stuff. And people would come in, they need this stuff, but they can't pay those prices. And there's all sorts of incentives to fudge and sell it to them below Blue Eagle prices. But Roosevelt had literally tens of thousands of bureaucrats out there looking for people who violated Blue Eagle prices. And if they found them, uh, they would rip the Blue Eagle out of their window. And then the patriotic Americans wouldn't shop at those stores, you see. Uh, even, uh, I said tens of thousands of bureaucrats, that's the figures I've seen, but hundreds of thousands of civilian volunteers, people that loved Roosevelt. They just loved the man, couldn't get enough of him. Uh, and, uh, uh, and it was mostly older women. It was the women that these days bankers refer to, probably politically incorrectly, ask Murphy, as the blue hairs. Okay? Uh, for some reason or other, when women get a certain age, they dye their hair blue. I, I haven't figured this out yet, but <laughs> the blue hair. So it, I don't know what color they dyed their hair in that period, but it was the older women that went out and went into the stores, and they were snitches. They were snitches. They'd cry poor mouth that they couldn't afford to buy this sack of flour, and their husband was out of work, and their son was out of work, and they needed to... And finally, the guy would, you know, be about in tears, and he was selling the sack of flour. And aha, she's a snitch, you know. She calls in the feds. And the guy loses his blue eagle. All right. So uh, that, that's the way the program uh, worked. And you could go over to uh, Warm Springs, Georgia, go through the museum, and, and see all sorts of of this uh, blue eagle uh, memorabilia. One of the, just as an aside, and this sort of helps you understand things. Uh, how Roosevelt was so captivating uh, of, of the American citizenry. Um, and that is that, uh, what time did we start? 11.30, okay. Uh, you've heard it said that he had, the, he had a magnetic voice. It was, it was just like he was there in your living room talking to you. And if you know anything about the level of fidelity of radios in the 1930s, you wonder, well, how did it seem like that? You know, you know, scratchy, bad reception, squeaking, and so on. You know, how did it sound like Roosevelt was right there in your living room? Well, Roosevelt was one of the first big politicians, important politicians, to discover how to use the radio by sitting at his desk, having a microphone in front of him, folding his arms, and just chatting in front of the microphone. Doesn't sound too hard, does it? But politicians. Uh, in that period, had a different uh, technique. They, they were they excelled at what was called at the time, I guess maybe still is, oration. Oration, right? What's oration? Well, a politician has to go out around the countryside, uh, stand up on a big pile of cow manure or something, and give a political speech loud enough that several hundred people can hear. Okay? And so they... Tended to speak very, very loud 
in short sentences with a booming voice. Okay? And if those politicians got a chance to say something on the radio, they would orate into the microphone. <laughs> and it would sound awful. Okay? You don't need to do that. But they hadn't figured it out. They were orators. So they would blast away at the microphone. Well, Roosevelt figured out, I mean, he, he could figure out something. He'd figure out that you don't have to do that. You could just talk in a conversational tone. And, and people were just amazed. It's just like he was right there <laughs> in your living room once you abstract from all the static and noise that the radio is making. So they, it was captivating. And so if Roosevelt said, don't, don't shop where these blue eagle uh, aren't displayed, then just don't do it. Okay. Make work projects. Uh, I'll tell you a few things about that. Uh, uh, that uh, the early one was that Civil Conservation Corps, where people really had to camp out in the woods uh, and uh, trim trees, and they said clear streams and lakes, clear clear them of what water or fish or what, but clear clear streams and lakes, and and uh, generally engage in conservation type activities. Uh, but a lot of make work projects were brick and mortar things, uh, uh, all sorts of things like courthouses and city halls. If you look in the south, uh, similar in other parts of the country, all the courthouses look about alike. They're the same period, 1930s. They were all WPA projects, okay, work, uh, Works Projects Administration, otherwise known as We Piddle Around. Uh, it didn't matter. <laughs> How fast you work, or just so you work and you get paid for it, and you build uh, uh, courthouses and, and city halls and uh, lots of other things. Uh, Skyline Drive. Have any of you driven along Skyline Drive? It's along the Adirondack Mountains, the Blue Ridge Mountains. Okay, that's a road that goes essentially from nowhere to nowhere, but it's fun to drive on and take a picnic lunch. Okay. And the whole purpose, that was a WPA project, the whole purpose was to give em employment to the people that built that road along the top of the ridge. All right. uh, another example is the causeway to Key West. Can you imagine that passing muster on a cost-benefit analysis? It's like the bridge to nowhere that was proposed in Alaska. Okay. Uh, I hesitate to ask that to my students here at Auburn because they have certain memories about being at Key West, so they think, yeah, that was worth it. <laughs> but uh, it's, a, it's a heck of a costly thing uh, that was built as a make-work project. Um, at the time, uh, this was a time of the Oklahoma Dust Bowl, too, during the Great Depression. And there were schemes afoot to, to somehow keep the wind off of Kansas and Oklahoma. <laughs> Uh, and they had a lot of money being spent uh, with that effort. And one, one of the ways to do it, yes. Well, yeah. Let me explain. <laughs> so, I mean, be a little optimistic, you know. To, and one of the ways they did it is that, the, is that they, they were going to build a double row of trees that went from South Dakota to the Texas Panhandle. And they were sycamore trees and Russian olives. That was Eleanor's favorite, the Russian olives. Uh, and again, the old history books uh, it will show aerial photographs of, of the start of this windbreak. They call it a windbreak. They build these trees to keep the wind down so it wouldn't blow the dust off of Oklahoma. Okay. And it turns out it was meteorologically unsound. So you should have been there. Because <laughs> if, the Rocky Mountains, if the Rocky Mountains don't slow that wind down, what's this double row of trees going to do? Okay. But it, it, it wasn't. I mean, they had more than just the trees. They had an, another uh, research that was done right here, not at the Mises Institute, but at Auburn University. Okay. And it was trying to find a cover crop that would keep the soil from blink, being blown off. And it was right here at Auburn University that they discovered the plant that would do that. Does anybody know what that plant was? Kudzu. kudzu. Okay, Auburn brought you kudzu. That's not quite right. Kudzu, if you know the history of kudzu, was a gift from the Japanese to the U.S. on the occasion of our centennial. 1876, Japan gave us a start of kudzu. It's the thing that makes a Japanese garden look like a Japanese garden. Okay, and and so Auburn 
the researchers here discovered that is a cover crop. Okay, that that will keep that will hold the soil, and it will. I mean, there were the, the, you know on, even on the internet today, you can find instructions on how, how many know what kudzu is. You recognize it? Okay, uh, instructions on how to plant kudzu, and the instructions are throw it over your shoulder and run. <laughs> 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 and uh, the kudzu has taken over much. It's taken over much of the South. Uh, you'll see it, uh, but unfortunately, uh, the climate's not right in Oklahoma for it to grow. It's too far north to grow in Oklahoma, so it didn't quite work out. Okay, but but that was the plan. It is, if you want a little bit of irony and justice. You know, sometimes there is justice in the world. The kudzu is encroaching upon the little White House in warm spring to <laughs> battle it. Uh, all the time. Um, WPA, we piddle around, CCC, a lot of uh, three-letter agencies that did things. I'll show you a few pictures. Give a man a job. I'm going to show you a little video of that because I'm going to save time for that. Um, one of the things that um, Jim Powell mentions in his book, or more than mentions, uh, that kept the recovery from occurring sooner than it otherwise would have, uh, was a very high... Uh, un, what was called an undistributed profits tax, uh, as high as 70%, I think. It was a pretty uh, confiscatory tax. And by undistributed profits, it just means the profits that the firm plows back into the firm as opposed to pays out as dividends. And, of course, the way firms grow, the way they get from small firm to big firm, is by plowing back into profits. All right? Now, who wants to start a company in 1933, uh, if you have the cards stacked against you, there wasn't an undistributed losses subsidy. In other words, if you make a loss, that's your loss. We're sorry. But if you make a profit and don't distribute it, um, then you pay 70% profits tax. Uh, if you make a profit and do distribute it, well, then your firm's no bigger than it was last year and you can do it again. But that, that's no way you know, to have a going concern. So, the undistributed profits tax just knocked in the head uh, any uh, effort of entrepreneurs uh, to, to start uh, businesses. The, what was behind the undistributed profits tax is a belief on the part of the Roosevelt administration that ultimately it was the business community that caused the Great Depression. They just had sort of a seething hatred toward the Wall Street and the business community. Uh, and so they should they should pay uh, for the damage they've done, and, and this undistributed profits tax uh, was part of it. And finally, uh, on my list here is the Social Security program. Uh, came in in 1937, and uh, was one of the uh, pieces of legislation whose intent was to knock saving in the head. In other words, Roosevelt uh, was was concerned that people were trying to save money. In other words, if you did have a job, you hadn't lost yours yet, and you were getting paid. You wanted to hold on to some cash. Uh, and uh, his, uh, his advisors explained to them that they just, you know, for old age or when they retire, they're going to need some funds. And so this was the birth of the Social Security program that we, no, no, tell the people, you know, we'll tell the people that the government will provide those funds. They don't need to save for their old age. That will be provided for. So it was a very Keynesian you know, like a paradox of thrift thing. We want to keep people from saving. We want them to spend instead. And we do it by telling them that the government will, will save for them. But, of course, the government doesn't save for them. It, it, it uh, has no savings account at all anywhere. Okay, well, there's a lot of stories. Uh, I'll show you pictures. You might have seen uh, a bunch of these. But uh, uh, no one had any money to buy anything except those hats. <laughs> Uh, you always tell the Great Depression a lot of fedora hats, okay? Uh, one of um, Nobel Prize winning economist Bob Lucas, he denies there's any such thing as involuntary unemployment. He says people are just binging on leisure. I mean, this is what modern economics has, has come to. And I think you can look at this picture and tell that these people aren't just binging on leisure. You know, these are, these are unemployed uh, people, it turns out. There's the NRA, the uh, Blue Eagle. Black here, but it's a black and white photograph. Um, and uh, let's see. 
There's a, now think, what do you think is going through that woman's mind? We do our part to keep prices high, <laughs> okay? She's posting this in the window and hoping it doesn't turn into a total uh, disaster. She sure wouldn't want to lose it. That's Civil Conservation Corps. I like that poster just because it looks sort of modernistic, but it was from the period. Uh, they had some good graphic designers back there, I guess. Again, WPA. Works Progress Administration, 1938. This was one, uh, either this one or one just like it, uh, adorns a brick wall in San Antonio, right at the end of the river walk. Have you been in San Antonio and walked done the river walk in the amphitheater? That's all the WPA project. They just took the San Antonio River, rerouted it around town, lots of labor, lots of lots of funds, and so on, and they put up their uh, their plaque. Okay, or WPA. Here's one I like because it. Uh, Auburn just celebrated its uh, sesquicentennial in 2006. And in the AU reports, as it's called, they had this picture of uh, Roosevelt uh, visiting Auburn. Uh, he's not driving. He's the guy with the hat, fedora, uh, in the back. So if you can read what it says, in late, this is late uh, March 39. Immensely popular Franklin Delano Roosevelt became the first United States president to visit Auburn. Townspeople joined students and faculty in cheering for the president who had led the nation through the depths of the Great Depression. <laughs> okay. And put jobless Americans to work on public works projects such as Chewacla Park south of Auburn. And again, if you stay next week and visit our local park, you'll find Chewacla Park uh, just south of Auburn. Uh, that was uh, part of the WPA project. I'm an antique car buff, and so in case anyone anyway, didn't recognize, that's 38 Cadillacs. Okay. <laughs> There's Chewacla Park, okay, uh, just south of town. Now, I hope this works, and let me give it a little intro. I mean, of course, it was kind of slow this morning, so I'll click it already. You recognize, uh, how many in here are old enough to recognize who that is? You, okay. No, don't admit it. That's Jimmy Durante, okay? Uh, last, his last movie he starred in was It's a Mad, 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 Mad World. Have you, have you seen that one? No? You went it. Uh, and I'll have to give this just a little, a little preview. It's just a two minute blurb, so we have time to show it. But uh, Hollywood did this for Roosevelt. It was a blurb right at the beginning of the New Deal program where his idea was jawboning. He wanted people to give a man a job. You know, you can, you can get us out of the recession by hiring somebody. And Jimmy Durante was a pusher. I mean, he was, he was hawking this program for Roosevelt. And there are others in here, too. In fact, I'll ask you to look. There's a person that is a exterminator. You don't get a very good look at him because it's from the back. But look at him and see, see if you're old enough to know who he is. Okay. And uh, we'll see how this goes. Now, I have to explain to my sophomores, this is not a Saturday Night Live gag. This is a, a clip that was shown as part of the frontage matter, the short subjects, in movie theaters all across, all across the country. So it's very serious. Now, if it won't play, I'll be irritated. This morning, it took it just a little while to come up. We'll see if, we'll see if we get lucky here. Yeah, it's loading. Thank you, just. Thank <laughs> you. 
Rosa. Now, to my job's extermination. You must give your assistance. Each a nice weekend vacation. And I'll need more men to kill the rat. We want you to hire a crowd. You took the voice if you hang out that sign and see no rats allowed. What's the matter with you? I'm a bad woman. Oh, I shall come to you. <laughs> you must get a duck up on the moon. You must duck up. For in Tokyo, one for us, Moses, and two for our children. One for Armenia, and one for Exilia. Two riders, drunk riders, sleep riders, train riders, or any other kind of a diet. That's the only thing. You like that? You must get a doctor for every disease in the sun. And that way you'll give your heart some enjoyment. And in that way, madam. <laughs> Shoot. You will help the men who run in the line. <laughs> now, I mean, if that was the common view, how are you going to fight that at the time? You know, absolutely impossible. Okay, thank you very much. Oh, what, who who was the exterminator? Anybody think? It was it was it was, it was Morris Howard. Mo Howard, you would recognize him if he was here with Larry and Curly. <laughs> One of the three stooges. <laughs>